Hello, it's Mark Goodacre here. Welcome to the NT Pod, the podcast all about the New Testament and Christian origins. It's episode 28, and today we're going to be looking at the disciples in Mark's Gospel. In the previous episode of the NT Pod, we looked at one of the real mysteries of Mark's Gospel, which is, why is it that you get these repeated commands to secrecy? The demons are told to be quiet, you get uh, people after they've been healed told to be silent, and, and then you get Jesus telling the disciples not to tell anybody about who he is. And I want to focus in a bit more detail in this podcast on the whole depiction of the disciples in Mark's Gospel because there's a real curious thing surrounding the depiction of the disciples in Mark. For me it's always been one of those key elements, I suppose because it was one of the very first things that I ever studied when I did Mark's Gospel. When I was a student in Oxford in the 1980s, my tutor was a lovely man called uh, John Fenton who recently died. And John Fenton used to pose these as really tough questions and just get you to read the gospel and to think about it. And I remember going away after he said to me, look, why is it that Mark is so negative about the disciples? And I went away and I just read Mark's gospel and kind of highlighted all of those passages where Mark deals with the disciples and tried to look to see if there are any patterns that were going on there. And the difficulty is that you start off with disciples who obediently follow Jesus. Immediately they drop everything and follow Jesus in chapter 1 of Mark. And then you get this kind of inner circle of Peter, James and John who do things with Jesus. But then from there things really kind of go downhill. So they consistently fail to understand what Jesus is talking about. Most famously Peter in the Caesarea Philippi incident which ends up with Jesus saying get thee behind me Satan and at the end of the gospel all of the disciples have clearly failed Judas betrays Jesus Peter denies Jesus and everybody flees and it's a particularly stark thing in Mark's gospel because there's no redemption for the disciples they there's no sort of post-resurrection sequence where they're all kind of restored to their full glory Now if you were to ask what their problem is, it does seem clear that Jesus' death and resurrection is really at the heart of what their problem seems to be. That's the thing that causes Peter this to, to make this kind of stark reaction in uh, chapter 8. And it's what Peter, James and John fail to understand in the Transfiguration in 9. And if you look at that place in chapter, chapter 14 where all the disciples are manifestly failing in a big way, it's all related again to Jesus' suffering. So the Disciples Peter, James and John are charged with this the, the importance of praying lest they fall into temptation and yet what they consistently do is fall asleep and of course Judas is instrumental in the arrest of Jesus. So it's the disciples and death and resurrection that seems to be the big issue in uh, Mark's gospel. So what's the explanation for this strange phenomenon of this really kind of negative portrait of the disciples in Mark? Well, one of the key books on this, and going back to my prelims in Oxford as an undergraduate back in the 1980s, the thing which we had to read apart from Mark's Gospel was a book by Theodore J. Whedon called Mark Traditions in Conflict. It was a really key book, and although most people disagree with the solution that Whedon provides to the problem, it's a very important book because more starkly than anybody else, he sets out exactly what the problem is. And he talks about Mark's vendetta against the disciples. He says that it's too easy to kind of gloss over what's going on in Mark's gospel and to say, oh, well, perhaps it has a pastoral purpose or something like that. And he actually got people to focus very carefully on what Mark actually says. Now, Whedon's solution to this was to say that Mark was kind of fighting a theology of glory. He was fighting a divine man Christology, the idea that Jesus was a kind of Superman figure uh, that that had um, come and uh, and all that he did was just marvellous miracles. He was a man of power and triumph. And Whedon said that Mark wanted to replace this kind of divine man Christology 
with a theology of suffering, with Jesus as a suffering Messiah. And his way of doing this was to make the disciples the representatives of this divine man Christology, this kind of super Jesus Christology, and then to replace this with the theology of suffering that comes through as a theme later on. So the disciples in the gospel stand for the people in Mark's community that Whedon thought Mark wanted to kind of get at. So Mark, Mark's kind of, it's almost like a letter that's deliberately polemicizing against particular people in his community. Well, in the end, Whedon's thesis hasn't proved persuasive. Uh, one of the problems with it is that people in general have got a little bit suspicious of the idea of reading the Gospels as kind of allegories in which the disciples are, are, are kind of standing in for someone else, in this case members of Mark's community. And people tend to think these days that the gospel should be seen at least as directed not just to their own community but also to other Christians. And, and it, it, it the, the thesis really doesn't kind of stand up to the kind of scrutiny that it would need to stand up to to be persuasive, not least because the evidence for this kind of divine man Christology is a little lacking. And the idea as well that Mark would have spent so much time narrating miracles and all the rest of it only then to, you know, kind of inf it's to, to stress something else in the second half of the gospel in the end hasn't been that plausible. But Whedon was definitely right that there's a problem there. And I'd like to look at just a couple of other possible explanations for it. Well, one interesting theory here is that of Michael Golder, who argues that Mark is a Pauline Christian, a follower of the Apostle Paul, writing a little after Paul's death, but strongly influenced by Paul's theology. And he thinks that Mark as a Pauline was kind of antagonistic towards Peter. And so although he uses all this material about Peter and the other disciples, that in that material, he he kind of gives it this kind of negative spin and it comes out of his kind of pro-Paul agenda. And Golder sees that kind of pro-Paul agenda in all sorts of ways in the gospel, like the attitude to the law and the attitude to suffering and the attitude to the person of Jesus. Now, it's quite an interesting and uh, radical thesis and it has a long pedigree because it goes back to the 19th century when a group of German scholars in Tübingen uh, really kind of uh, made this uh, the, 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 the basis of, of a whole kind of theory of Christian origins. And it's certainly an interesting uh, thesis and one worth um, reflecting on. It's one I hope to come back to in the future on the NT pod. Another one that I want to home in on um, is uh, that of Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza. Now, Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza is a biblical scholar at Harvard, and she's done probably more than anybody else to look at feminist uh, reinterpretation of the New Testament, feminist reimagination of Christian origins. And one of the things that she does is she draws attention to the fact that it's not disciples in general who are failing in Mark's gospel, it's specifically the male disciples. And she points out that in Mark's Gospel, the female characters are essentially very positive characters and role models. So, for example, the woman in chapter 14, the unnamed woman, does something that Peter is unable to do and connects Jesus' suffering with his identity as Messiah because she anoints Jesus for his burial. And Jesus as the Messiah is the anointed one. Burial is to do with his death. So by anointing Jesus for his burial... She is able to link together Jesus's messiahship and his suffering in a way that people like Peter were unable to do. And it's one of the great ironies of that incident that when Jesus says, whatever she has done in the whole world will be told in memory of her, that we actually don't know her name. She's anonymous in uh, Mark 14. And that, that phrase, though, in memory of her, was used as the title of one of Schussler Fiorenza's books. But it's also important to notice that in chapter 15, when Jesus is crucified and buried, it's women who were there watching. Mark makes quite clear that women were there, and he has a really interesting note, and this is where you get Mary Magdalene and other women. He has this really interesting note where he says that they had followed him and been ministering to him since his time in Galilee. So in other words, they'd done the two things that you need to do as a disciple. You're charged to follow Jesus, that was the charge of the first disciples in chapter one, and they've ministered to him, which is what a true disciple does, one who serves. So it looks like 
Shusli Fiorenza is really onto something here in that the female disciples in Mark's gospel are depicted as positive role models. There's a slight problem with it, which is that the gospel ends on rather a sour note for them in the sense that they don't go and proclaim Jesus' resurrection but actually don't say anything to anyone for they're afraid at the end of the gospel, assuming that the gospel ends at 16 So it, it, th- there is one kind of problem with this rather positive spin that the women have, that, that, that the gospel ends with them and it ends with them on this slightly negative note. But nevertheless, it's very, very interesting to focus in on those comments that Mark makes about the disciples and about the female disciples at the uh, towards the end of the gospel. But what else can be said to unravel this mystery of the depiction of the disciples in Mark's gospel? Well, regular listeners to the podcast probably won't be surprised if I throw in at this point something that I've talked about before, which is that I think in the New Testament, one of the really big issues, probably one of the unifying issues in the New Testament, is that Jesus is depicted as Christ crucified, as a suffering Messiah. And this is said in 1 Corinthians 1 to have been a stumbling block to Jews. And Mark, I think, through his depiction of the disciples, is trying to show us, remember that these disciples are people who have problems with death and resurrection, this kind of thing. Mark is trying to show us that the death of Jesus is indeed a scandalon to these people. It's a stumbling block. It's something that they really struggle to come to terms with. And one of the things that Mark is trying to do through the gospel is he's trying to provide a kind of narrative resolution to this kind of problem so that the reader that's sympathetic with the idea of the cross as a scandal by the end of the gospel has worked through these issues, has turned around and has come to see that it is indeed Jesus's destiny. And that might be the kind of literary reason for this kind of motif that 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 Mark is lining the disciples and especially Peter up with people uh, who uh, make, making them like people who in the first century had real trouble with the idea of a crucified Christ and he's trying to kind of get you to come to terms with that idea through his narrative. Well, thanks for listening to the latest episode of the NT Pod. It was the second of three episodes on Mark's Gospel that uh, coincide with the course I'm teaching here at Duke at the moment on Introduction to the New Testament. The next one will be on the Passion and Resurrection in Mark's Gospel. You can find me on the web at podacre.blogspot.com or on iTunes U or Jude's iTunes U. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter at uh, Goodacre and I look forward to having your company again soon.